y'all think too small, I got big dreams. You just start I'm way ahead at the end scenes. Started reading and dodging all of the quick schemes. Money like your Spotify, boy, I got 10 streams. Be real big, I gotta make it just for my kids and for their kids. Just kids. That's what Hi, I'm Sarah. And I'm Daniel. And this is the Dealmakers podcast, episode 18. And we have Sada Boss here, who is a fantastic uh, guy with an accounting practice background, but entrepreneur who is the owner of Snap Advisory in California, former client of mine. And I would love for you to give more background, Saad. But um, one of the things that I wanted to uh, kind of point out is um, you were a former client. You have closed on deals. You're running deals. Um, and as you know, our podcast is about kind of adding color to this fantasy of how easy it is to buy a, a business and then sail off into the sunset. Um, so you're doing that. Are you on a boat right now in the Mediterranean? Are you in the sunset? Is everything, has your whole life been made really simple? I think we all know the answer to that. And which is, it is horrible. Everything's difficult. Everything's a pain. <laughs> I'm tired constantly. It's kind of like having another child, right? Like you, you just... Uh, nothing ever goes right. And sometimes it does. Right. And you get so happy for like the little things yeah. like uh, I, I guess maybe, maybe it's fatherhood mixed with like the business, but I've noticed myself getting more and more emotional when it comes to these, like client the other day was like, Hey, thanks so much. I know you're so busy. I appreciate you. And I was like, Oh, thank you. I appreciate you. Like, <laughs> it's like the littlest things. will They'll just get me. I'm like, you're welcome. I am working hard for you. I appreciate you notice. <laughs> That's wonderful. So give a little bit of a background. How did you decide you wanted to buy an accounting practice? And when did you close on it? We closed last November. So November, 2023. Um, and I'd originally, you know, I, I was unsure of exactly which direction I wanted to go. Uh, I originally started, it was just me, a handful of clients. I primarily focused on fractional CFO or interim CFO type work. Uh, right before that, I had been doing some consulting uh, with like M&A transaction advisory, work with a lot of private equity companies. Um, and I actually kind of got the idea in my head. And I was like, you know what? I made a lot of people a lot of money, <laughs> you know? Uh, and I'm like, and, I, and I've been killing myself the whole time. So I'm like, hey, I should do this. And, you know, I should yeah. be working this hard for myself. Um, and then you also see everything they're doing and you're like, hey, you know, they don't always take your advice. And you're like, I could do this better. Uh, yeah. My original thought was, you know what, I'm going to do that. I'm going to acquire business. I'm doing this already. Um, and I was looking for anything that wasn't an accounting firm. <laughs> <laughs> I think I remember. I was all like, sure. product, product is good. I can scale products. People yeah. are hard. Um, and lo and behold, you know, I ended up with an accounting firm. Um, so I, I went through the thing was that, that was really nice. That really helped uh, working with other business owners too, was just, going through so many deals before I even decided on an industry. So originally it was actually much harder, right? So, so in the, in the searcher space, when you're searching for a business to buy, they, they tell you, Hey, get your thesis going, get, you know, focus, uh, focus on an industry, focus on this. Um, and originally I was searching part-time, which made it that much more difficult because you're really limited on time. So when you start really valuing your time a lot more, you, you start, start being extremely picky. Uh, you know, you, you just immediately try to get to a no as fast as you can on any deal. And, you know, just start going through deals. It's a numbers thing. Just just like most things with sales and leads, right? You're getting leads for deals. You're, you're going through them and you're making contact with the brokers. Okay, this one's out. This one's out. Um, and eventually when I, when I settled on, okay, you know what? An accounting firm, you know, I, I keep getting drawn back to it. It's what I know. Um, and just knowing everything I know about the industry, it's, it's very, you know, they have a saying, uh, and I forget, I, I, I heard it from a lady on, on one of the conferences I was at. She's like, you know, accounting has a PMS problem. And, and she said it's pale, male, and stale. Um, <laughs> and it's very traditional. It's very, you know, old school. It's very paper-based. And it's very uh, kind of spread out. when it And, you know, it's always an individual. It's all centered around the individual that's really hard to replicate. It's really hard to scale. It's really hard to transfer from one owner to the other. So I, I you know, kind of had this idea, okay, you know, maybe an accounting roll up. Um, when I say roll up, it's really just, I want to want to build a good firm, like a decent sized firm, not too huge enough that I still can interact with some of the clients. I can step in where needed. Um, but, you know, just a, just a good place to, that people want to work and people are providing a good product. Um, and, and, you know, I try to, productize the service so that we can have kind of that consistent level. 
let's go, let's go back to the beginning real quick. So first of all, I mean, I'm so glad to have you on the podcast, Saad. I'm looking forward to hearing, uh, you know, all the details, but where did this all begin? Did you know you wanted to be an accountant like, in school? Was it like your childhood dream? Where did this begin? Early on, uh, I didn't know what I exactly wanted. So I came from a small business background. You know, my dad had a, a shop. It, he would import goods and wholesale them uh, in downtown LA. And um, so I kind of, and those were my summers. So I would go and I would actually just kind of work there. You know, I'd, I'd do everything from, uh, you know, handling clients to inventory deliveries to to, to the plumbing. I, I did the paint. We, we acquired a a warehouse and I, you know, went to Home Depot, got the spray painter and like sprayed an entire warehouse of paint. Like it was, it was interesting. That's entrepreneurship though, right there. Like that's, that's the perfect example of it. Okay. So you want to get into importing, by the way, you're painting too and doing right, plumbing. Right, you're the plumber, and... <laughs> you're the jet. I, I yeah. honestly have been debating like, you know, cause, cause I think on LinkedIn, especially, you know, you know, having that CEO title or having the, the founder title, it's a little pretentious in my opinion. So I, I'm always like, literally the janitor like i will do you know it's just there's just yeah. problems and i need to fix them like i it's, you're, you're scaling a business i would much rather someone else deal with like most of the things that i deal with but here we are that's a major challenge with a lot of a lot of business buyers so i find so many people coming out of corporate that are like middle management like director vp level they go and they want to buy a small business boring business and then they're very surprised what, what all that entails. Funny enough, that's part of my sales pitch is like, hey, you got into business to do this or you became an engineer to do engineering, not to do your bookkeeping. Let us handle that for you. <laughs> I'll take care of this and that. Um, and it's 100 percent true. It's the same thing I try to do with my marketing. You know, I would love nothing more than to have a marketing company. And I'm just like, here's some money. Just take care of all of it for me. And you tell me what I'm missing. Right. Like um, and I try to get this into my staff as well when it comes to just the tax side. Um, you know, when it comes to, and it's maybe just a customer service thing where, uh, I notice this a lot with tax professionals. They're like, well, this is my system and they didn't fill this out in the organizer. They didn't tell me about this. And I'm like, yeah, but like, you're the professional, like something should have been like, let me just double check with them. You know, if they have foreign income, they probably have a foreign bank account. It doesn't matter if they mark no on the tax return, right? Like they explicitly said they do not have one. But I'm pretty sure they do because you're getting you're getting some euros and you're getting deposited somewhere. It's not a U.S. account. So, I mean, those types of things I really try to push. And it's really hard to put that into your processes. Nobody cares as much as about your business and your clients as you do. So I my, my plan now, at least, has been to like, let me focus on training, 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 like always kind of try to bring your staff up is the best way to kind of replicate yourself. But it's so hard to go f- because if you're an employee, like you said, if you're a middle manager, you're not used to that level. Like you, you might be a great middle manager. You might have put out w- great work product, but is that a, you know, is it? It's not exactly the same as like making sure that the letterhead is perfect, so that when someone else does it, it comes out the way you need it to. So it's a good reflection on you, company. Well, and that's like such a such a buyer beware call out for professional services firms because. So this this was brought to the forefront of my mind the other day. I tried to write my own agreement, and uh, Sarah was kind enough to look at it for me and and pointed out something that wasn't there. And it's so it wasn't that I couldn't go online and pull a, tra- a, a template. It wasn't that I couldn't go to ChatGPT. The problem was I didn't know what I didn't know. So the value is from a professional service perspective isn't isn't necessarily just in what we know. It's, it's being able to look at a tax return and say, hey, this is there, but so this other thing should probably be there too. Yeah. And um, I mean, that's so incredibly difficult to replicate. I mean, 100%, anybody can do it cheaper than us, right? You can do, you can, I, you know, you, you can do your own contracts, you can do your own marketing, you can do your own bookkeeping. It's going to be cheaper. Is it going to be as good? Never. It, it can't be. You just don't have the years of experience on what to do in different scenarios. It's it's experience over education regardless of anything. And ChatGPT is not to the point where it can be like, what am I missing? It's good. It's great, actually. It's phenomenal. But it's still not where you, where it can replace a person. Part two to that is, you know, a lot of people are like, hey, are you not afraid of AI replacing uh, the things? And I'm like, no, because guess what? QuickBooks has been trying to sell you on 20 years of like, you don't need an accountant. Do your own bookkeeping. <laughs> and it's the best thing for my industry ever. Uh, so same thing with AI, like you, someone still has to learn how to use AI. It's a tool at the end of the day. Now there's going to be shifts, of course, and you better know how to use it. 
to you know improve your productivity and integrate it into your tech stack. But um, replacement wise, I'm not too concerned. And, and in the businesses like law and accounting, where one sentence or one missed number can cost you tens of thousands of dollars, it's better to have somebody else responsible for that. It still answers the question you ask. And that's what we do in professional services is like, and to, to the annoyance of our clients is we don't answer the question they asked. <laughs> so we answer all kinds of questions they should have asked. <laughs> so, um, But uh, I want to hear, Saad, about prior to my involvement, you know, all of these deals that you went through. And I loved the way you said getting to know as quickly as possible, because as you know, that's like exactly my goal is just efficiency and like breaking the deal if it's going to break quick so you can move on. Were, were you already self-employed? I, I just want to make sure we have this context. Because I think we have a, I don't want to miss a spot. Because I think it's going to be really relevant to how you found this deal. So were you, did you go from, so you went from school, you got into accounting first after your entrepreneurship and then accounting or? Door to door sales, hundred <laughs> percent businesses, right? Uh, I was like, gradu- so I graduated around 2009, you know, uh, not, not the best time. And I'm actually a finance major, right? So the thing was, uh, your finance major, you're like, all right, I got a bachelor's degree. People are going to want to hire me. And then everyone's like, hey, you can sell insurance. You can sell real estate. You can sell securities. And I was like, uh, what about? I wasn't smart enough to be a financial analyst, right? So the big bank. So I was like, okay, so then what do I do now? I know I'll, I'll, I'll go into accounting. That'll be a backup. So back then, that's all you needed to sit for the CPA exams was an accounting minor. Um, mm-hmm. And I did much better in my higher level classes just because they were a lot more engaging. So I was like, okay, let me do that. Uh, and then even with that, with my, with my accounting minor and like, you know, the non-traditional accountant still found it hard to this, I guess this was 2010, found it hard to actually get um, accounting related roles. So here I am, 100% commission role, like just like, you know, going door to door, all these businesses trying to sell Verizon services at the time, you know, um, great, great experience. I highly recommend sales to as, like, as many people as possible. I hated it. It's not for me, but the experience was great. The training was great. There's nothing like pounding pavement to, to really get that. In fact, I was actually thinking the other day, like I should do that for my firm. I'm not even joking. Like just go yeah. to a bunch of businesses. I don't think I've ever heard yeah. of a CPA going into a business and be like, hey, do you need a CPA? <laughs> we'll see if I ever get the guts to pull that one off. Um, and then from there, uh, I went to, you know, I just did some, um, went into property management. And then I went into, and then I finally got into working with uh, CPA, a local CPA. I actually met him. As I was selling him a little mini fridge on Craigslist, <laughs> and we just started talking and like, I can How to get a job like at an accounting firm. <laughs> yeah. 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 So, and then that's where I got started really. And I, and I was very heavily focused on the business side because for the businesses, mm-hmm. you know, we handle the bookkeeping, then we, and then as you handle that, they ask you a ton of other questions on things that are completely unrelated. Uh, and around back, back then too, um, this is still. Uh, still early internet when it came to things like your Dropboxes and your Google Drives and your syncing things. So I implement, I did a lot of IT work as well. So we were probably one of the first firms to do a lot of this stuff remotely, including like QuickBooks. QuickBooks Desktop is a great example. It's a horrible, horrible product because it's desktop based and everything's online now. So you have to like rent a server to be able to get it. Well, uh, I was able to just put it in Dropbox. And as long as only one person was in the file, you're okay. You don't get conflicts. Um, but it was mostly me, right? It, it was uh, either I was at it at the office or I was using the file at home and then Dropbox would sync the two. So as long as I didn't accidentally leave it open when I left for the day, it was all good. Um, so working with business owners, I got a ton of experience that way. I eventually moved into uh, more of a consulting role that was more like a, a, like fractional CFO based. Mm-hmm. And again, they on your own or in that firm? No, no, no. Different different firm altogether. So this is a consulting oh, okay. company and they focused on no tax, just uh, just fractional CFO. Um, nice. And right. from there, uh, and, and that was my first foray. And that is probably where I learned the most just because you have like five to you know six, seven clients sometimes. And this is again, pre-digital internet. So you I drive from one client to the other, right? So this is in LA. So I'm like in the morning, I'm like driving, you know, 6 a.m., 5.30 a.m. to get to, you know, from the Inland Empire to the Santa Monica area for one of my clients there. Um, and, you know, at night there's tons of traffic. So I'm like staying in my car, getting some fast food and studying for my CPA exams. And 
How lucky, though. I mean, even today, 2024, there's not a lot of dedicated fractional CFO firms. So to get in and get that experience for an advisory account, I, I'm right there with you. I was not great at punching numbers into a tax return. So advisory accounting was a better fit for me, too. So I, I mean, that's awesome that you got to do that and focus on that. Regardless of how often I get involved, I, I am the one that finds the problems in the returns and I'm fixing them. I stumble my way through the fixes, right? Uh, because I know what the end product's supposed to be. And if you know that, then you're just like, I don't know what it is, but I know it's not this. So then you just keep working through it and you kind of figure it out and you go from there. Or you bring somebody else in. Thankfully, um, maybe my networking hasn't been great with other businesses, but it has been great with other CPAs. So I have been able to find you know good resources that I can call and ask questions for. Uh, and that's that's a big big part, especially if you're a solo uh, solo owner, right? You're you're like, who do you talk to when yeah, you don't the know? network? When you're yeah. like researching and it's like, ask a tax professional. And you're like, yeah. shit, I am the tax professional. <laughs> like, yeah, if you're your own lawyer and you're like, I got it, open it. Yeah, yeah. yeah consult your <laughs> lawyer. And I'm like, oh, <laughs> um, that's very demoralizing. Yeah, it's a dumb thing, but you know, my husband's a physician and a lot of our friends are too, and they're on there too, being like, oh no, it says consult your doctor. <laughs> like, I'm in, I'm in the hospital, I'm the doctor. <laughs> and that's, that's the thing you find out, right? And and you know, you talk to other firm owners, and they're like, "Yeah, I have no idea either." Like, I will just we're gonna have to figure it out. We'll try it out, and we'll see. And if there's a problem, we'll go from there. It's amazing what happens when like you get into a position where you see what's possible. So like you're in you're in private equity, you're doing the you're looking at these M and A deals, and you realize, like you said, like you said in the beginning, that you're making other people rich, and you're like, "Wait, I could do this for me." So is that when you made that transition? Yeah. So, I mean, imagine, imagine doing that consulting role and then also looking part time. It was, it was the worst because uh, you're already putting in a ton of hours and then you're trying to close on some other deals. I thought it would be good to start with a partner. So somebody who already had an established CPA firm. And I was like, Hey, I can, you know, we can do it a couple of ways, but um, it's always hard with partners because um, you may not always be hundred percent aligned. It's hard selling your, your, your vision, so to speak. And the other thing, too, is you don't, you don't know how committed they are. So I kind of went through a couple of people. I went back to actually the, the original firm owner that I worked for for the first time uh, back when I started my career. Uh, and we were kind of going through it. So we found a couple of deals that might work. But it was kind of the same problem where it was still a very traditional firm. Um, so it's hard for me to even get him on board onto the changes because um, there's always that fear of, well, what, what are we going to do with this? What are we going to do with that? Are we going to change things? So then I decided, of course, to do, do it on my own. And then that, that search process, I will say one thing that was much easier when I decided what exactly I wanted, it became much easier because now I know what I'm looking for. Before it was a wide net. So you're looking everywhere when you decide hey, I want an accounting firm. And then when you start even getting smaller, like you're like, OK, maybe not nationwide. I want it more localized and I want it to do these things and I want it to you know, have all this stuff. I don't want any, you know. I don't want the average fees to be like $300 for a tax return because uh, I'm not buying an H&R block, right? So um, you start getting all these filters in and it makes it so much faster to go to a no because immediately, before it even yeah. comes to you, right? You, you, you can have the, the brokers. And of course, there's brokers that specialize in nothing but that accounting niche. Actually, there's multiple brokers that do that. Yeah. The same thing is true for multiple other industries. There's brokers that do nothing but this type of business. It's it's a little bit harder in, in many other industries, um, you know, like yeah. manufacturing. I, I haven't really seen a broker that's like, I only do manufacturing or, or something like that. They're they're all relatively open, uh, but you but you also get used to, okay, the deals coming from this broker tend to be this. The deals coming from that broker come to be this. This broker's just full of it. This broker's like, you know, really go, being being a good broker in terms of okay, they're truly vetting me versus just giving me a hard time. Mm. Um, and or you have the brokers that are like trying to make this deal happen. And you're like, none of that makes sense. I wouldn't sell this business to me. It doesn't even make sense. Like why? Like okay, you know, you, you, your BS meter starts going off and off, especially when you're when you when you're really focused. When it's your money on the line, right? When your house is on the line because you do you're doing a personal guarantee for the SBA. So you start becoming really like perceptive about a lot of this stuff. That's such a great testimony for that because I, I talk to buyers all the time and they're like, hey, keep an eye out for a deal for me. And I'll ask them what industry they're interested in. Like, oh, anything, anything that cash flows. 
It's like, yeah. okay, this is gonna be a hard road. <laughs> um, so I love the fact that you said it gets easier when you when you pick an industry. It sounds like an industry that you have a background in also helped because you could have that BS meter. And then picking an industry that you have experience in where you have a BS meter and there are brokers that specialize. I mean, now you're just really simplifying the process. It's still very complicated, as I'm sure you're going to tell us, but um, but much easier, much easier road. Right. I mean, and it's you can apply the same thing to to most marketing, right? If you got if you if you're like, hey, so I started networking more with people. Just hey, we were in the same industry. Like, let's talk, or we're we're doing this. And, you know, at the end of the calls, uh, most people are kind enough to be like, hey, so how can I help you? Like, what can I send your way? If you just say, oh, just anything, you know, wh yeah. what are they really yeah. going to send you? You'll never way, get right? anything. You never get anything. So, so, you know, a core to marketing is like, have a clear message. Same thing for anything you do in life, right? You tell this to your kids too, like, hey, what are you doing? Like, what's your goal? What, yeah. What's, what's the plan here? Uh, so same thing with what you're looking for in a business. You can't be, I'll just look for anything. You gotta be more and more specific. So you finally found a deal and I, I want to get into the, I want to hear about the deal. I want to hear about how the actual transaction happened. And, and if you, if it was easier, if you had struggles, but, but context to that, did you, did you seek out a niche firm or did you plan on buying a firm that you were then going to niche? I was having a hard time just getting to where I am now with, okay, like these are the filters I'm looking for. I'm it's, it was incredibly hard for me because you know to a certain degree, you don't know what you don't know. Like, you know, the accounting work, but you don't know the, um, the process of buying another firm. Like I've been on many deals, but there, you know, you, you had teams of people on both sides of the buyer and seller deal. Like it's completely different and you don't have nearly as much support when you go downstream. You know, when you had teams of people, everyone's just trying to cover their butts. Like yeah. I did my thing, like boom, boom. And then this is like, here you go. Someone else reviewed it. Now it's just you. And if you get lazy, that that's on you. Right. Or if you mm -hmm. miss something that's on you. So it's, you know, highly stressful. You're trying to figure it out. Um, and the, and regardless of how many deals you do, it just hits different when it's, when it's you doing everything, you're making the call. You, you do not have anyone you can really talk to. Even if you have an advisor, you know, they're going to advise you, but they're not going to make that call for you. You're ultimately responsible. So it's completely different when it comes to, um, you know, your experiences doing it for other people versus doing it for yourself. Um, so, so that, that was a big problem. And actually this was my second deal. My first deal Lots of lessons learned, lots of expensive lessons learned, um, lots of legal fees paid. Uh, thankfully, okay, so here's the big thing that saved me a ton of money is I did my own due diligence. And because I've done quality of earnings, because I've, you know, dealt in, dove into a lot of this stuff, because I know the industry, I, I you know, saved tens of thousands of dollars compared to anybody else that was doing the same thing I was. I mm -hmm. couldn't say that for the legal side of things. So, uh, so I still had to spend, <laughs> but, um, what got me was this one deal that fell through, you know, you still got to pay for those legal expenses. So I ended up you know, losing at least a little under 10 K uh, on that deal. And, you know, the biggest lesson there was like, you know, be sure, be sure the, the, the seller's in and never, ever, ever do an LOI that isn't exclusive. Yeah. Uh, like, that's a good lesson. I was, I was going to get desperate at the time. And that's when it really, that's when you make mistakes, right? Cause you're, you're tired. Yeah. You've been looking and you just want to move forward and you find a good enough deal, which is okay. Good enough is a good standard to go by because nothing's going to be perfect. But, um, you know, that one little kind of thing where you, you're like, okay, that's okay. I understand where you guys are coming from. Um, and then, and then you really do yourself an extreme, you know, big disservice because at any time something can come in and sweep it off from away from you. And then there's no guarantee that your funds or your, you know, you're getting that all that, time and you know those expenses back so hindsight being 2020 say you're uh, some listener out there you have three hundred thousand dollars you saved it up or you inherited it what's your budget now that you know what you know right because mm -hmm. you may have the 10 percent down for a three million dollar deal but if you have 300 grand how much <laughs> are you setting aside for for burned deals so you can find the right one? Oh, interesting um i guess it depends on a lot uh but if you're self-funded I mean, you you better be sure, right? If you have three hundred k, hey, you can't afford a three million dollar deal. Like that's ten percent. What are you, where are all the fees going to come from? Like, if you have three hundred thousand, you could maybe maybe afford a million dollar deal. Maybe, like there you that, go. That's, that's kind of true if you don't get from the influencers. Yeah, you know. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, you, okay. it's ten percent. Get out of here. What are you going to do when you just acquired the firm? Uh, and you know the, the the AR doesn't come with the firm. 
So like all the receivables, all the billings that they have to do, even if you if there is AR, um, there, there's working capital needs. Oh my God, I can't tell you how many. And this is just from like the uh, fractional CFO side, right? Like people are just bad at cash management and they don't even know what working capital is. And, and it's just like, you need money in the business. Like at any given time, the business is eating up like, you know, thousands of dollars, tens of thousands, maybe even a hundred thousand, depending on how big it is. If it has inventory, oh, that 300 isn't going anywhere. Like you can maybe afford a half a million dollar business if there's inventory involved. Like get out of here. Like all that money that's going to be just sitting there and then your payroll comes up. You already spent all your money on the 10% down payment. How are you going to make payroll? Right? Like it's a, it's a, it's a real thing. So even with the traditional CPA firms, all the revenue, not all, but majority of the revenue comes in at four months a year, maybe. So if, if it is a traditional model where you're just doing tax work once a year, what are you going to do for the rest of the time? You have full-time staff. You got to pay for it. You can't just save up all your money and then like, you know, try to desperately uh, ration it out for the rest of the year, uh, which is why, you know, I focus on the, the let's say the modern for, well, I'll get to that in a second. But anyway, so, yeah. so that was, you know, the deals falling through and all that other stuff, right? Uh, my deal, I'll, I'll talk about it in a little bit, but like I put in the minimal amount of cash possible because A, I'm a big fan of leverage, but B, I knew I was going to need cash for for so many things. You know, I know that I didn't know what I was going to need that cash for. So it was a very important that I had cash available, including other debt available outside of, you know, my line of credit and outside of the SBA financing, just to be able to make sure that I don't, you know, mess this up. Now, it's really hard to mess up a CPA firm, right? You never heard of a CPA firm going out of business. Uh, but, you know, when you have a large debt payment, that changes things a little bit. My whole idea was, you know, to not be in, you know, not be working in the business, working on the business, but that's expensive to do, especially mm -hmm. so like any, any funds left over would then go to debt service. Uh, so then you better have a very good growth strategy, which I thought I did. Right. Uh, but no, I did not. So, um, so then consider it motivation for, you know, concentrating on your marketing plan, concentrating on ways to grow the business and, you know, optimize it as much as possible. So the deal that didn't go through with that letter, letter and intent that was non-exclusive, um, I don't I don't have any memory of that. <laughs> this was um, before we met. This okay. was before we met. <laughs> okay. So, so yeah. I mean, that, that, that's a nice little, uh, uh, you know, kind of segue, but also a nice little ad for Sarah. Like, Sarah wouldn't have let me do that. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks. Thanks, Sad. <laughs> um, but, you know, I am like when I first started out on my own and leaving the large law firm, I focused on startups and they would say, do you have any like special deals for startups? And my special deal for startups was prioritizing. Like, I'm not going to do everything you need all at once and then charge you for it. I'm going to do things you absolutely critically have to have at the juncture. You absolutely critically have to have them so that if it doesn't take off, you haven't like invested a bunch. And I'm always trying to toggle that and make sure. So like. The legal spend, the bulk comes in the transaction transaction documents, um, and I try to you know people are different and when they want those, but usually like commitment letter, LOI, diligence done, primary you know on site visits have happened. Maybe you've even met with the employees is a pretty safe time. Yep. yep, all of that was done. This was like purchase agreement was about to be signed, like and then you know like th that and that was a big thing with the LOI like. What, you know, they shouldn't have been looking at anybody else at all, right? So it's like, well, you, you know, because all, all, all the time spent for the due diligence, I mean, that would have been an extreme cost, right? Um, and then all the time, you know, going out there physically, meeting with the meeting with the staff, uh, kind of getting to know everything, digging through everything, just all that time you're never getting back. So, uh, so be very sure, like when you commit, and if the seller's not willing to commit, that's fine. There's there are other deals out there, like you. It's painful to say no and, you know, stick to your guns, but you're going to thank yourself much later. The different paths you can take into this, it creates such an interesting chain of events because I find that when you go from private equity to buying a Main Street deal or when you learn from people who come from private equity or investment banking versus like the old school business brokers. So I get to see both sides of it. The old school business brokers don't even really do LOIs. They go straight to a purchase agreement with a due diligence built in. But it's because on one side, yes, you're locking in that buyer. So you're more likely to have a deal go through. But you're also getting a commitment from the seller. So it's really saying like, hey, we're all in this. We're all committing. 
there's still a way out with diligence, but it's such a more solid starting point. And I didn't come from that. I got into that later after I learned the LOI side. So when I got mm -hmm. into it, I was like, I was like, no, LOIs are better. I'm, who's going to sign a contract? Now that I've seen some deals go sideways, it's like, yeah, I get it. I get oh, the perspective. Oh, no, Daniel, ugh. Like, that's the <laughs> that's terrible. It's, it you, depends well, on the deal size. It's, yeah. It does. It does. And there's so a, much so. Yeah. yeah. There's no right answer. I mean, either way, it could go wrong. I mean, there's a little bit of a right answer, but like pros you and cons to everything. You should have been doing deals when the pandemic happened in March and a whole bunch of people had signed a purchase agreement that had no financing contingency and all the SBA loans were pulled. And so now everyone was contractually obligated to somehow come up with like $3 million out of their own pocket to do a deal. <laughs> so like the right purchase agreement would have that contingency, right? Like, Actually, that's, that's funny you say that. That is why my deal fell through because Ooh. I would not let go of the financing contingents uh -huh. and some other guy was they came in with cash right so so he didn't care so i'm like yeah okay uh but it was one of those things like i again first deal financing it on my own if financing fell through uh, you know you lose your earnest deposit like you you lose your you got nothing to go back on so like i couldn't afford to do that so i so then, you know, I gave them a lot, what I could, but then when it really came down to it, I was not willing to give that up. What about the deal that went through? So the deal that went through was was fairly good. Um, and it really matters to the seller. The seller does matter. Um, of course, you're always going to find things after the fact. And you're like, well, that wasn't exactly how he presented it. But I guess it's on me for not doing enough due diligence. Um, but, it, you know, that being said, like, it's still like you have to have a good relationship with the seller because there will be problems after the fact. And you need their help to solve them. Um, so as much as, you know, and you can put it into the agreement, like, oh, you're going to do so many hours of work and you're going to, you know, consult on this and blah, blah, blah. <clears throat> None of that really matters. After after the money exchanges hands, like, good luck with anything. 100% One, of the time, I think it's extremely important to have uh, seller financing. So you, the seller has to have skin in the game in part as part of your success. Um, it varies by industry, but for me, that's like a bare minimum. Like it always needs to be at least like a 10% or something. Um, and then having, having things to having something in there so that the seller, so you have some way to, you know, rectify any issues because for accounting firms specifically, we have revenue guarantees, right? Uh, but if you pay for the hundred percent for the firm, good luck getting any of that money back. I haven't seen a revenue guarantee go through lately. I mean, I haven't seen, and, and Sarah sees way more deals than I do. So take that with a grain of salt. But like of the deals I've seen, I haven't seen any any sellers agree to a revenue guarantee because of the number of buyers out there right now. Yeah, it's getting expensive to buy. But the, here, here, and, and then the horrible part of this too is they're not even good firms. <laughs> like they're not even good deals and they're getting like these stupid offers. And I'm just like, I, I can't like justify it. Um, and you know, my, my thing's always been, and this is the business side of me is I'm just like, how can I make, you know, how can I make, solve this problem? How can I make this work? Well, it's the best deal possible. And you know, for those of the uh, listeners that don't know, like when you're in an industry, uh, you can, you can get a hundred percent financing. If you go for another business that's in the same industry as you usually, um, uh, uh, you know, same code as you. And from there, you could do 100% financing. The thing is, the interest rate's about 10.5% right now. Uh, so, so it better be a good cash flowing deal. One caveat to that. So that you have the same next code or NAICS code, but um, they will let you get by with a little bit leaner of a cash flow on the target because they're not going to make you build in your own salary like they did on the initial one. Of course. Of course. So, so like, and we're, we're always talking like kind of EBITDA, but of course you don't need to duplicate yourself. However, if you're any sane person, right? If you're buying a firm from another person, that person's yeah. retiring, you got a full-time head. And if it's a firm owner, it's more than a full-time head that you're replacing. That's true. So, and and that whoever you're replacing, they're never going to do as good of a job as a firm owner anyway. So, so it's like, okay, yes, that's true, but you better be factoring in the fact that now you have mm. more, probably more than a full times worth of work that you need to hire in for. And yes, the, the bank will finance many deals that might not make sense for you as a buyer. I could get financing for a lot of this stuff. I still think it's a bad idea. 
because I don't want to cut it that close. I know I, whatever it is, I just know there's additional expenses. You know, it's cutting it tight and there's just so much more work for not much of a payoff. So you got to be very careful. You can get, there are banks that will finance you, even if it's, even the death debt coverage ratio is like very low and, and you, you know, you might take some liberties or it might be very liberal with that forecast of yours, but you know, who's really paying the price at the end of the day, if this doesn't work out. So, so that's one thing I like to remind people. And that's, I guess, more and more on the tax planning side or on business planning side. So I have clients come to me and ask a ton of questions and they're like, should I do this deal? And it might be real estate or something like that. Right. Because it's just good. They want the appreciation. They want this. And I'm like, sure. Yeah. This is what it looks like when we do your taxes. You save this much, this much, this much. Now, oh, by the way, if I take all that out of here and I just look at the cash flow, these tax savings are going to cost you an extra hundred K a year. Um, so I'm very like cash focused, like cash over everything, right? I will find it. I will, you know, get as much debt as I, as I want, but I will make sure that the cash flow is there to support the debt. I'll make sure that there's something that works, but it's, you know, it's a like common business practice versus what you would see in, in like a textbook or, or somebody who concentrates on nothing but tax. Focus on the industry that you understand. Uh, work with a professional, make sure you have exclusivity in the LOI. How do you track your freaking deals? And it's basically how to use HubSpot to track your deals. And it's extremely helpful because if you're talking to so many brokers, um, you know, you don't know which, like when people called me, I was like, hi, hi, so-and-so like, oh, and what is this for exactly? And, you know, they get offended and I'm like, I'm looking for many businesses. I don't know who you are, but HubSpot does this nice thing. It kind of pops up and tells you exactly what deal and what phone number put some clarity to that for the last couple of minutes i'd love for you to tell anyone that's listening who needs a cash flow focused accountant advisor uh, if someone's trying to buy a deal uh, how can they reach you how can you help them uh, what would you like the listeners to know about you and your services if anybody wants to connect with me just go to snapadvisory.com uh, there's like a calendar in there you can just schedule a meeting with me directly i try to make it as painless as possible unless you're trying to sell me something in which case shoot an email info at snap advisory and we'll see how that goes but um <laughs> where i concentrate honestly like all my stuff is i figure hey uh when it comes to the searchers the people that are listening to this podcast that you know they probably use a little bit of a help um with just, a, just maybe like a little consulting but then if i'm able to provide some value to them in that initial call or something when they do acquire the firm they're going to need that bookkeeping service they're going to need that you know tax service and hopefully that kind of converts over for the individual side you know the big focus in the CPA industry right now has been getting away from the solo 1040 work because you're, then you're competing with the H&R blocks, mm -hmm. um, but to focus on tax planning. You know, somebody, people generally, I, I want at least the ones I want to focus on, want a continuous relationship with their CPA throughout the year versus just during tax time. And it works better too. You have fewer clients, you can concentrate, you can service them better. Uh, and from there, you actually understand your clients better because now you're not managing 300 clients. Maybe you're managing 50 to 100 clients per per CPA or per EA or whatever you want to go with them. I mean, I, I've sent you referrals because I think you're a very unique option because California, uh, which is great. You know, like it's really helpful to have somebody who knows California tax and, and you're so entrepreneurial. Um, so I feel like, you know, there's a lot of competition for, um, you know, in the Valley for, you know, there's really, really expensive options that can service entrepreneurial companies um, in California, but finding a person that's got a smaller shop and a more like boutique practice that still has that competency is very rare. And that's, it's a very valid point because the, the biggest thing with advisory is I need good data in order to advise people. And every, and that that's the reason I started focusing more on like the simple bookkeeping stuff is because before that, if you don't have clean books, I can't really advise you on anything. Yeah. Like, you know, most of the stuff I think is very valuable, right? Like when we do the bookkeeping, it's replacing like a bookkeeper you would have had to hire or right. your admin person that probably doesn't know exactly what she's doing anyways. So I'm like, hey, you, you have to do this either way. Either it's your time, your admin's time, somebody's time. And regardless of what it costs, like pay a professional to do their thing. That's one less thing you have to worry about. You can concentrate on you. And then when you're ready for, for that actual, you know, maybe some of that fractional CFO to bring on somebody to, you know, maybe help with cash flow or help with any of this stuff. We have our foundation for the numbers that's accurate. Thank you so much for coming on and, and talking us through your origin story and your deal and, and sharing all the insights. We're going to have to have you back to do some deep dives into some of these things because I feel like we 
we just scraped the surface. The, the biggest thing, honestly, that, that a lot of people should take away from this is don't buy a business because <laughs> it is that much of a pain. I'm not even joking. It's just, just I know you're not. Yeah. You, you, you think you know, but you don't, right? Yeah. Um, so unless you're, unless you're like ready for a lot of pain, then just know that you're getting into yourself into something you have no idea what you're getting yourself into. Episode 18, just don't even buy a business. This is it. This will be the last episode. We're done. We'll wrap it up. Cut. <laughs> this is the end. All right. All of all of the links and resources will be in the in the show notes. Uh, Sad, if you want me to share anything, send it over. I'll I'll make sure it's in the show notes for everyone. And yeah, can't wait to have you back to do a deep dive into some of these uh, more in depth concepts for people if you're open to it. Oh, definitely. Oh, you guys are amazing. Uh, you know, I will. Uh, I mean, Sarah already knows. I tell her this all the time. Like, it's great. You're great. Nice to meet you, Daniel. And right. thanks for having me on. Thanks of course. for I gotta make it just for my kids and for their kids' kids. That's wealth years and years. Promise my brother, soon as he out and finished this bid, we finna do it bigger than.